Little Fox. Superstars in History, Rosa Parks. Welcome back to Superstars in History, the talk show that features famous people from the past. I'm your host, Faye Moss. Today, we're talking with a courageous woman who took a bus ride that helped change America. She didn't take discrimination sitting down, and her bravery inspired many others in the fight for equality. Please help me welcome Rosa Parks. Thank you, Faye. It's nice to be here. You're most famous for a very fateful bus ride, and I want to hear all about that day. But before that, why don't you tell us about the world you grew up in? I was born in 1913 and grew up in and around Montgomery, Alabama, during the Jim Crow days. Jim Crow was a system of segregation laws and an unwritten code about how black people were to be treated in the South. Blacks went to different schools, ate in different restaurants, and drank from separate water fountains. We also had to sit in different parts of buses and trains. Segregation laws were only part of the problem, right? That's right. There were also terrorist groups like the Ku Klux Klan that targeted black people. By the time I was six, the Klan was riding through the black community, burning churches, beating people and murdering. My grandfather told us to go to bed with our clothes on. That way, if the Klan broke into our house, we would be ready to run and get out fast. That must have been really scary. And back then, it wasn't easy for black people to vote for better conditions. The white people in charge made it difficult for blacks to vote. They made us take ridiculous tests, guess the number of jelly beans in a jar, things like that before we could vote. They also charged a fee for voting, and most blacks were too poor to pay. Not being able to vote meant we couldn't elect leaders who would work to change the system. We had to change it ourselves. Did you start by refusing to move to the back of the bus? Well, that's what I was best known for, and it was a very important incident. But it wasn't how I started. By the 1950s, I had been working for years with civil rights groups that were trying to make sure blacks could vote. I also helped raise money for the legal defense of people who were arrested for resisting Jim Crow laws. Of course, I became one of those people. Tell us more about that day on the bus. It was December 1st, 1955. At that point, blacks had not demanded that buses be desegregated. We had just asked to be treated with more respect. I was on my way home from work as a seamstress for a department store. I took a seat just behind the whites-only section of the bus. But when the bus got too full of white people, the bus driver told me to move further back so a white man could have my seat. I just sat there. He shouted at me and told me to move. I said no. Then he told me he would have me arrested. I said, you can do that. That was so brave. Well, other black people had refused to give up their seats for whites before. I had done it before. But they usually just threw us off the bus. When this driver said he would have me arrested, I knew that if I let them take me to jail, we might be able to build a movement around this. And we did. The local black community led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. organized a bus boycott. To protest my arrest, black people refused to ride on city buses. The leaders who organized the boycott intended it to only last one day, but the people of the community kept it up, even after I was released from jail. That's amazing how the community came together. It wasn't easy. People had to get to work somehow, and few blacks at the time had cars. 
Black churches raised money to buy station wagons and formed carpools to take people to work. The white leaders of the city of Montgomery were not happy. The city buses were losing a lot of money because we weren't riding them. The police harassed the carpool drivers, giving them tickets for traffic violations, even when they hadn't committed one. I got many death threats. Dr. King's home was bombed. Fortunately, he and his family weren't harmed. But we carried on brave and strong. The boycott lasted for 381 days. That's more than a year! How did it end? Well, while we were all protesting and refusing to ride the buses, the movement's lawyers were working in the courts to challenge the segregation laws. Then, on December 20th, 1956, a Supreme Court ruling went into effect that made bus segregation illegal. We had won. Was that the end of the movement? Oh, no, it was the beginning. The bus boycott showed black Americans that if we could stand up to unfairness and inequality, things would change. The civil rights movement continued to grow. We got many new laws passed to protect our rights. For example, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 made it illegal to discriminate against blacks. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 protected our right to vote. As for me and my husband, after the bus boycott, we both lost our jobs. Eventually, we moved north to Detroit, Michigan, to find work. So did you give up activism and settle down to a peaceful life? Not quite. I guess I was just born to be a troublemaker. <laughs> I continued to work in the civil rights movement and stayed involved in politics. For many years, I was an assistant to a U.S. Congress member. I kept working for good causes as long as I could. You are truly an inspiration. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mrs. Parks. We'll let you get back to history now. Thank you, Faye. Rosa Parks spent most of her life fighting injustice and inspired a generation of activists to do the same. In 1996, President Bill Clinton awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. She died in 2005 at the age of 92. Her body lay in state at the U.S. Capitol. She was the first woman and the second African American to be honored in this way. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. I'll be back soon with another famous face from history. Superstars in history, Martin Luther King Jr. Welcome back to Superstars in History, the talk show that features famous people from the past. I'm your host, Faye Moss, and I've had a dream about interviewing today's guest ever since I launched this show. A pastor, civil rights leader, and powerful speaker, this man changed history with peaceful protests and stirring speeches. Please join me in welcoming a personal hero. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you, Faye. Let's get started, Dr. King. You were born on January 15th, 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia. Did you have a happy childhood? Indeed I did, thanks to two marvelous parents who filled our home with love. My father was a pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, so I grew up listening to his sermons and witnessing firsthand the power of words to move and inspire people. Meanwhile, my mother taught me that everyone is worthy. Nobody is inferior to anyone else. Those were probably important lessons, since you grew up in the segregated South. 
Yes, it wasn't an easy place for a black child to grow up. Slavery was abolished when the Civil War ended in 1865, but African Americans still weren't treated equally, especially in the South. There were laws that made all kinds of racial discrimination legal, and segregation was everywhere. Restaurants, movie theaters, beaches, parks. I couldn't swim in a city pool or drink from certain water fountains. When I was six years old, a white playmate I had known forever suddenly wouldn't play with me anymore because he was starting at a white school. Not even children's schools were outside the bondage of segregation. When you were 14, you won a prize for writing a speech about segregation. Yes, I'm proud of that award. But the occasion was marred by what happened on the trip home. The bus driver made my teacher and me give up our seats to white passengers. We had to stand in the aisle for 90 miles. That was the angriest I ever was during my lifetime. How awful! Did you go to college after high school? I graduated high school at 15 and then attended a black college. I decided to become a minister like my father, so I went to a seminary in the North after college and eventually earned a PhD. During my studies, I became fascinated by Mohandas Gandhi, the activist in India who advocated nonviolent protest as a way to reform society. I began incorporating Gandhi's ideas into my approach to fighting for civil rights. In 1954, you moved to Alabama with your wife. After living in the integrated North, why did you want to return to the segregated South? Well, I was hired to serve as the pastor at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, and I had a hope I could fight segregation in my position. The following year, I did indeed help to lead a large protest in Montgomery. Oh, you're talking about the Montgomery bus boycott. After Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat to a white person, African Americans boycotted the city buses for over a year. We met at my church to organize the boycott, and I served as a spokesperson. It was exciting to be involved in the movement, but also dangerous. I received death threats, and one night while I was out at a meeting, my home was bombed. Oh no! Was anyone hurt? Fortunately, no. In November 1956, the boycott finally ended when the Supreme Court ruled that segregated bus laws were unconstitutional. We'd won a victory, Faye, but there was more work to be done. I traveled around the country supporting folks in other boycotts and speaking about nonviolent protest. Speaking of nonviolent protest, you participated in many sit-ins at lunch counters. What can you tell us about them? In the 60s, students began holding sit-ins at lunch counters where only white people were served. They'd sit down and quietly demand service. White people sometimes threw food or taunted them, but the protesters just sat there in silence. Those students were a glowing example of nonviolent protest. You got arrested at a sit-in or march, right? Yes. By then, I had moved back to Atlanta to serve as a co-pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. In 1963, I traveled to Birmingham, Alabama, where black folks were staging sit-ins and marches. When I was arrested after joining the protest, I wrote a letter from my jail cell that described our philosophy of nonviolence. I felt I had to write the letter. White ministers were calling us lawbreakers. I wanted to explain that nonviolence is a powerful, and just weapon. It draws attention to injustices. Your letter from jail is really famous, but it's probably not as famous as your I have a dream speech. When did you make that speech? Back in August 1963, I helped to organize the March for Jobs and Freedom, which attracted over a quarter million people to Washington, D.C. We were marching for equality for all people, regardless of race or gender. Most folks remember this part of my speech. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. 
I practically know the speech by heart. It made you super famous. You were named Time Magazine's Man of the Year. And the following year, you won the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, and the March on Washington led the government to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which made segregation illegal in the United States. After that, I focused on international peace and economic justice. I spoke out about the Vietnam War and worked with the Poor People's Campaign, a coalition of poor Americans advocating for economic change. My final fight for justice came in 1968 when I traveled to Memphis, Tennessee to march with sanitation workers striking for better pay. Perhaps you could share the rest of the story without me? Of course, Dr. King. Thank you for joining us. We'll let you return to history now. Remember the power of peaceful protest. Goodbye. On April 4th, 1968, during that trip to Memphis, Dr. King stepped out onto the balcony of his hotel. Tragically, he was assassinated by a man who supported segregation. Dr. King was only 39 years old when he died, but he had already accomplished so many things in his fight for civil rights. Today, his dream of equality for all people lives on, both in his famous speeches and in civil rights movements around the world. Thank you for joining me. I'll be back soon to interview another superstar from the past.